Father's Day. Thank you. I heard that lone voice in the wilderness back there. Before we get started with our, our teaching time, if you guys would just give me just a few moments, I wanted to spend some time uh, saying thank you to somebody that's near and dear to our church. Uh, Chad, can I bother you for a second, please, if you don't mind? I know I am bothering you. I just... No, I'm fine. I just. I know, I'm sorry. You caught me off guard being here this morning. It's good to see you. We haven't seen you in a couple of weeks. You guys have been traveling and resting and doing stuff. And yes, we've been very busy. It's really good to see you. So, um, most of you know better than I do that Chad served our church for many, many, many years, keeping the books and keeping the finances straight. And uh, he recently stepped down from doing that position, and, and Barbara has taken that position over. But we, I wanted to say thank you for all the years of service that you worked so diligently. You didn't take pay. You didn't get in the limelight. You just worked very hard and very faithfully. And I just wanted to say thank you. So this is a small gift from our church just to say that we love you and we appreciate you very much. Thank you for your ministry. And I hope as time goes by that God will continue to uh, use your skills and talents inside of our church because we need men just like you um, a lot. It's good to be here this morning. It's, it's Father's Day, so we're stepping away from our, 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 our series. We're almost to the end of the series on missional living, and we're going to spend some time talking about fathers today. Father's Day is a very special day. Mother's Day snuck up on me mainly because I'm not a mother, so I can't really communicate from the mother's perspective, uh, but today's Father's Day, and I'm a dad. And many of my friends here are dads, too, so we communicate from that as well. So before we get started, let's uh, spend some time. I'm going to share some scripture with you, and then we will um, get started on our time together this morning. This is out of the 103rd Psalm, beginning in verse 11. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him, for he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. So, Father, we praise you and thank you so much for today, for the idea of fatherhood that you expressed so beautifully through your son, Jesus. You have a son, and you said you were his dad. And we're just grateful for that model that's been laid out for us. We worship you because of your power and your grace and your mercy and your long suffering. We thank you for, for the promises that you made to us in your scriptures and that you're coming back to us again to take us home. Amen. We're so thankful for that today. Yes. Precious Jesus, Son of God, yes. in your model prayer that you shared with us in your scripture, you said, our Father who art in heaven. Our Father is plural. It's for all of us. You recognize me, us, to be in your family, to be in the family of your Father. And we, like you, can call him Father as well. We're thankful for that. We all share a dad. Thank you for being a dad to us when we needed you the most. Your perfect love, your perfect power delivered us perfectly. We thank you for the men who you've placed in our lives as fathers, both in the biological and in the spiritual, for men who have poured into us, uh, helping us through hard times, through difficult times, through raising us up from a child into the people that you've called for us to be. Thank you for those men who weren't my father, but were a father to me. Thank you for their wisdom and their patience and for their grace. And most importantly, we thank you for forgiving us and teaching us to forgive as we've been forgiven. By faith, we've been set free. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. 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 I'm glad that you're here today. If you're a visitor here, I want to welcome you especially. I don't think I see any visitors, but nonetheless, uh, it's a good opportunity to remind you that uh, inviting our neighbors and our friends to church with us is a beautiful thing to do, and you can do that as well. Uh, 
If you guys would just take a moment, look to the one another's to your right and to your left, and wish them a happy Father's Day. And happy Father's Day to you as well, from me. So tonight, there's no, there's no uh, worship service tonight, no Bible study tonight. Uh, we'll be starting again next week on Sunday. And format's going to kind of change, and I'll, get, I'll have more information for you next Sunday. It'll be a good time. I um, also wanted to let you know that uh, we have space for you to volunteer. If you're not volunteered in a Sunday morning ministry, there's a space for you. Uh, wherever God is leading you, God will not lead you to a full space. So just communicate that with me or with uh, one of the leaders in our church, and we'll get you plugged into a place uh, where that you need to be. Also, I want to remind you on Father's Day that... On, on the second Saturday of every month, the men's ministry gather together, and we have breakfast and fellowship and a great time. There's two things that are going to happen. Number one, we're going to eat probably too many carbohydrates, and I'm not mad about that because I try not to eat too many carbs. But on Saturday, it's for the Lord, and I cheat. And the other thing that's going to happen is men are going to spend time together, fellowship with one another, enjoying each other's company, and it's, it's and just and just talking about being a guy and working and jobs and family and all the things that, that men um, deal with on a, on a daily basis. It's a good time. I've been every month since I've been here, and, um, and back in February we went as well. It's just been a great time. Uh, Tony Gutierrez is the, the facilitator for that. If you have any questions about that, get with me or get with Tony, and that'll be good as well. So it seems that uh, there was a, a young father-to-be who was... Um, in the hospital, pacing up and down the corridors as his wife was inside the delivery room delivering a brand new baby into their life. And the man was just writhing his hands and he was covered in sweat and he was mumbling to himself. He was just a mess. Pacing back and forth and his wife is struggling with the rigors of childbirth. I can't comment on the rigors of childbirth because I never had a baby. But I can comment on being a father of a young mother who is having a baby. And it can be rather stressful. So he's walking back and forth, and he's, his brow's covered in sweat, and his, his, his body language just reveals this agony and intense suffering as his wife was inside the delivery room um, going through her own particular agony and intense suffering. Finally, at 4 o'clock in the morning, the nurse popped her head out of the door, and she said, Sir, congratulations. You're the father of a brand-new, healthy daughter. He was very relieved because everyone was safe and happy. And as his wife was recovering from the rigors of childbirth and, the, and his brand new daughter was being introduced to life outside of the womb, he cried out in ecstasy. He said, thank you, God, that she was born a girl. She'll never have to go through the agony that I just went through through childbirth. <laughs> Men can be kind of silly sometimes. Having babies is tough. I don't know how to have a baby. I've never had one before. But being a dad can be tough as well. It's just amazing how selfish we can be sometimes. It's tough to be a dad. And in, in, in honor of this special day, I want to speak to those of us who've been blessed with the great privilege of being a father. There's dads in our, in our midst here today who are killing it, just doing a fantastic job. And there are some dads who may be struggling in their new role as father and, and trying to, to, to find their bearings and, and, and to make a straight way for themselves. And, and there are some, uh, like me, who has experienced um, failure as a dad. Being a dad is hard. But I don't just want to address fathers. Because there's some men in here who aren't fathers at all. But I do want to address men in general. And, and even though this is a day that fathers usually... Uh, receive a gift of some kind. I want to speak to um, men and fathers about a gift that they can give to others, not just your children, but to everyone around you. And it's the most precious gift. It's a gift for their children, for your friends, and for your family. But mostly this gift is a gift that you will give to yourselves. It's very difficult being a man in 2022. If you're waiting for my next line to be a bashing of millennials, that's not really who I am. I don't believe that those things are true by and large. But I know that things in 2022 are much different than they were in the 80s and the early 90s is when I was having my children. There's a lot of, a lot of different kind of pressures, a lot of things going on in, in a man's life that I really can't relate to intimately 
Um, but I'm always open to have those conversations to learn uh, the things that, that you guys are going through. The, the, the pressures that you, that you go through every single day were unthinkable 30 or 40 years ago. Face it, the days of Leave it to Beaver and, and Father Knows Best are gone. Sadly, that old adage of Leave it to Beaver and Father Knows Best is really, really old and doesn't communicate very well. It makes me feel really old. So let me unpack that for you, if I may. When I was a little kid, there was a show on TV, and one of them came from radio from back in the 30s and the 40s called Fathers Know Best and Leave it to Beaver. And it seemed to be the epitome of a family. But the fact of the matter is it wasn't. That family never really looked like anything that my family looked like. But that family seemed to be operating in a place where there was mutual respect and understanding well, except for dad was kind of higher than, that's a whole other conversation. But they'd had, they had conflict and they worked it out with love and compassion and understanding. It was really idyllic to say the least. But the fact of the matter was, my family never looked like that. Probably yours probably did not either. But the sad thing is because of the power of television and the media and me growing up, I had that, that conflict between what I saw in my own father and what I saw on TV and it created a lot of tension in my heart and a lot of whatever this is, misunderstanding and, and trials and tribulations and, and struggles. So, so I want to, to, to say that your family situation is, in fact, your family situation. And for you to compare yourselves one place to another, one family to another, is really kind of a waste of time, unless you're comparing yourself to the Heavenly Father and the Son, Jesus Christ. And that is a perfect model. We can be thankful for that. Men today are quite different today than they were uh, when I was younger we can all probably make quite a list of changes that our culture has experienced over the past few generations. And many of those things are, are positive changes. It, it's really a, a wonderful thing, and I see it throughout our church, and it just pleases my heart so much. There's men who are actively engaged in their, in their children's life at a very resonating and it, it level that is making a big difference. Let me see. Dad's holding their babies and feeding them and, and, and playing with them. And, change. and I've been with you in your houses, and you're, and you're the same at home as you are here, if not more so. It wasn't like that back in the, back in the day. Moms raised the kids, and dads hunted bears and did all that kind of stuff. And to be honest, we suffered for it. My generation suffered because of that. Dads are very special people, and... And, and dads who are overcoming the, str the struggles and the sufferings that we find in, in, this 20, uh, in 2022 are even more special. I just applaud you. I'm just so proud to know you. I want to be like you in a lot of different ways. You know, growing up, I had many different heroes. I had the Lone Ranger. Remember the Lone Ranger with the horse and the mask and the hat? And I never really understood his role, but he was always flashy and cool. And I don't know why he wore the mask. It's all kind of weird to me. But I liked him. It was kind of fun. Superman was always a hero to me, saving the day and, and for right and justice and the American way and the waving the flag and super, that whole thing. I, when I was a kid, I liked that. And Batman, of course, I was a hero. Batman was a hero of mine in the comic books. Not so much the, 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 the dark Batman currently portrayed, which I, I kind of like better. But when I was a kid, Batman was funny, and he, he wore a great suit, and he had the hat and the ears, and that was very, very cool to me. But my biggest hero was probably someone you may have never heard of. It was a man from Oregon, and his name was Larry Mahan. Larry Mahan was a rodeo cowboy. And uh, when I was a kid, my dad rodeoed all up and down the West Coast, and Larry Mahan was the, was the um, all-around champion cowboy five years in a row. And, and he was great. He was just fantastic. And I would see him uh, behind the shoots during rodeos, and, and I felt like I was in the presence of, of somebody really, really great. The good thing, he was a kind man. He still is. He's still alive. He's a kind man. He's always kind to the kids that was running around him. Give us autographs, and he let us sit on a saddle. It was all the kind of great stuff. He was a good guy. He's a good role model for a young man. Uh, and then one day in uh, 1974, I think it was, a new guy on the scene named Phil Lynn took his title away from him. I was mad at Phil Lynn for 20 years until I met him. And he's a nice man, too. Mr. Mayhem reminded I ran into him in Fort Worth. Mr. Mayhem reminded me that 
Time moves on. You get old. You can't do the things that you used to do. And he was the next generation, so I learned to forgive because of that as well. He was a good guy. But my, but my first hero was my dad. My dad was in the military uh, for all of my years growing up, and he was in the Navy. And I remember my earliest memories of my time with my father was he had a 1962 Ford Falcon, and he loved that car. And he was out working on the car, and I don't know, I don't know what he's doing. I was probably in diapers still running around it. My dad had his toolbox laid open, and he was inside the car beating on something, trying to get it loose. And I looked in the toolbox, and I saw a hammer, and I picked it up, and I tapped the headlight. And it made a very fun sound. And my dad kind of looked at me, then I tapped the other headlight, and that also made a fun sound, and that was the end of my car working experience for that day. But my dad, he could do anything. He, he was a cowboy. He could break horses. He, he was in the Navy. He flew planes. He did all these great things that I thought my dad was the greatest guy in the world. And as I grew up, I learned that my dad wasn't perfect. But I learned it much, much too late. And I'll talk about that in just a moment. There's so many uh, things in common that these, these men of, uh, this generational men had and when I was coming up that for the most part has been handed down throughout the generations, right down to ours today. And, but sometimes I think that the greatest disservice that's been handed down to fathers and men of this day and, and generations in the future is, is this one thing, a crippling fear of intimacy. It's amazing how we were taught that as, as youngsters about, the, the, about being intimate and how, how a men were not where we're supposed to be. Intimacy was not a fact of life for men growing up. I, I never heard my dad share his hurts and his fears. My dad was a, in the military during the Vietnam War. He's seen things that he never talked about, and I understand that. But just the things about being a dad can be kind of scary sometimes, or being a husband, or, or, or the financial woes, woes of things that happen inside of a family. My dad never shared those things. He kept it all inside. He didn't talk about the things of his family, and he didn't talk about God. It's not that he was a cold-hearted creature with no feelings. My dad was a sensitive, caring man who's no different in most ways than you and I. He just never was taught the need for intimacy in relationships. And I think he suffered tremendously for it. And I learned the same thing from my dad and my sons probably from me. But Jesus, aren't you glad? that we can learn to be intimate inside of our relationship with Jesus. And I'm so grateful for that today. Jesus was a powerful example of how to live an intimate, fully masculine life. I've come to believe that one of the most important things that a man can give to his child is the godly example of an intimate relationship. There are men like this in our church who look to Jesus in how to define their relationships and and I'm glad and other men like me sometimes struggle and suffer, but I still look to Jesus and to other men around me and I'm, and I'm guided by this and encouraging by this godly example that's been set before us and the same is true for you as well. <clears throat> that was the sign. There we go. The mustache is so cool. Thank you, Bettina Marie. I appreciate that. One of the reasons an intimate relationship with God is so important is because it sets the stage for other successful relationships. Intimate relationships in all areas of life flow from an intimate relationship with God. That's a truism. And by the way, let me unpack this idea of intimacy. Sometimes we say the word intimate, we go straight to the physical. A husband and a wife can be intimate with one another in a way that's intimate. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the ability to be, to be transparent, to be available emotionally, to be able to share my feelings with people I'm, I'm with and with people whom I love. That's the type of intimacy that I'm talking about. And every, and all, every relationship is, flows through that intimacy that we have with the Father. I've said it before. And when this relationship between me and the Father is healthy, this relationship between the, the one and others is healthy as well. That includes my children, and that includes 
of my, my spouse. And the same thing is true for you. I will, I will find you probably almost every single time. I can't say every single time. But then when this relationship is struggling for one reason or another, then these relationships will struggle as well. Jesus taught us and showed us how to be intimate with the Father. And he showed us how to be intimate with one another. I desire, therefore, that men pray everywhere, lifting holy hands without wrath and doubting. That's 1 Timothy 2.8. This is worship. And just for clarification, it's not just men. It's also women. But this is Father's Day. So forgive me the, uh, uh, the intrusion out of the feminine to the masculine. I desire, therefore, that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and without doubting. This is worship, and this is an, ex an expression of intimacy with God. That's what worship is. It's an expression of intimacy with God. When you and I are, are engaged in the act of worship, we are engaged in a very intimate act with the Father. The Father listens to us sing. The Father sings with us. The Father sings over us. He, angels worship when we worship. Worship so intimate, so beautiful, and so valuable. Lots of times we, throughout our day, we may treat worship as a, as a thing I'll get to later, then the day's gone, and, or something that may be a very high priority in your life, and you set aside time every single day just to praise and worship the Father. Worship looks a lot different in different circumstances. It's not always singing of songs. Sometimes it's just praying. Sometimes it's just being in the Spirit and being quiet. Do you know how hard it is to be quiet? I have a spiritual discipline that I'm learning, and I'm not very good at it. Three times a day, I have an alarm go off on my phone at 8, at 12, and at 4. And when the alarm goes off, no matter what I'm doing, I stop, and I empty my mind and my heart and my mouth of words. I begin with a very quick, thank you, Jesus, and then I listen. Quiet. And then I start telling Jesus what to say. And then two minutes is up and, and I'm still learning how to do it. But it's been a very powerful, it's been a very powerful exercise for me because it's making it not be about me and my thoughts. I want to hear what the Father has to say. I want to hear what the Spirit is, tested, is telling me about things that are going on in my life and the things that are important to me. Me telling the Father what's important, he already knows. I want to hear from him. So I'm practicing the discipline of being quiet only for two minutes. I have a goal. Before the end of the year, I want to get to five minutes. But first, I got to get two minutes done. It's hard. It's hard. It's a, it's a great discipline, though. So with prayer, prayer is an intimate conversation with God. That's all prayer is. It's an intimate conversation with God, lifting holy hands without anger and doubt. With intimate faith, I don't know what that word is, um, with God. That's okay. Anger and faith with God. So prayer, prayer is an intimate conversation with God. It's just simply that. It's just a conversation with God. We can be very formulaic in our prayers, and sometimes we need to be because I don't have words for the Father. But he's given us prayers throughout the Scripture that we can recite by memory. That's a good thing. But it's such a beautiful thing to have an intimate conversation with God. And, and by lifting holy hands, it's, it's an intimate posture with God. Look at what's happening. So many times you and I find ourselves, and we, especially men, we're sitting like this. This is not an intimate posture. This is not open to anybody or anything. In fact, what you're conveying to the world around you is, please don't talk to me. Don't look at me. I'm not really interested in what you have to say. So when some of you are doing that when I'm preaching, I don't take it personal. But I understand the quality of the preaching is, eh, sometimes it's kind of lack. But this is what this means. What intimate worship looks like is lifting holy hands. This is an intimate posture. My I am exposed. My body is exposed. I, 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 I'm open to dangerous things that are floating around me. I'm lifting up my hands to my father like I want to be picked up and held and loved by my dad. This is awesome. This is what this is about. This is not about trying to out-Pentecostalize the guy next to you. This is about an intimate conversation with your dad. Dad, I love you and I need you. I'm hurting. Hold me. That's what this is. It's a sign of vulnerability. 
And vulnerability is a key aspect of intimacy. And then to do so without anger and doubt. It's an intimate faith with God. When we can even go to God and say, I'm angry about this, or I'm doubting this. Can you please help me? Please help me. He will. He's faithful and he's good. And I'm thankful for that. This picture here is a man who doesn't come strutting into God's presence. And, and, and he comes with holy hands, hands lifted high, hands that, that have had something happen to them. They've been transformed. This is a man who comes to the Lord with an openness and a recognition, knowing that he is received and accepted by the Father, made new in Jesus. You and I can know that we've been accepted by the Father. We can know that. We should know that. Many times we forget because we get caught up in our own memories and the things that are keeping us uh, bound down. Excuse me, bound down. But we, we can come to the Father and be, know that we are accepted. Because of what Jesus Christ did for, uh, for us on the cross, our sins in the past are not part of the conversation anymore. I'm thankful to know that today. I read somewhere that, uh, I don't remember where I read it at, so I, can't, I couldn't give proper credit, that Pastor Jack describes his intimate relationship with God like this. He says, it's as if God drank coffee. Have, have you ever imagined having a cup of coffee with God? I have to admit, I've never really imagined that. It just seems, that seems uber, uber intimate. But I like this picture that Pastor Jack paints for us. It's as if God drank coffee, and you could feel comfortable coming to him, and you would pour him a cup, and then as you sat there, you would pour out your heart as well. Imagine it, just the two of you, God and son, or God and daughter, sitting there over coffee as friends sharing the deepest thoughts of your heart. Question, have you ever had a cup of coffee with a friend and did that very same thing? I have, many times. Thankful for that. We can do the same thing with God. There's a silly comic strip I see on Facebook from time to time called Coffee with Jesus. I kind of struggle with it sometimes, but it really paints a picture of, a, of an intimate relationship with God. I'm having this problem, God. I don't know what to do. Can you help me? Or my heart hurts. Or I'm praying for this person because they're having this struggle. Or, or I need a bill. I don't know how to get this bill paid. Or all the things that happen in life. Or sometimes just to say, God, I'm thankful for you, my dad. Thank you for being my father. Thank you for being my friend. Um, a man with a real personal relationship with God will learn that his walk with God allows for such pouring out. It requires an emptying, though. It requires an emptying of anger and pride, lust, or anything else that may be eating them. And the fact of the matter is, the way we experience that emptying is by doing that. God, give me a new mind. Give me a new heart. Transform me, clean me, make me whole, forgive me. And then a level of intimacy will begin to flow even deeper. Peter said this. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. This is an interesting picture of a, of a believer's relationship with the Father. Now, part of the thing is this, is that as men from my generation, we were raised up with men like John Wayne. I love John Wayne. Don't misunderstand me. But that pull yourself up by the bootstraps and, and get it done on your own, that's not, a, that's not a picture, that's not a scriptural example of a relationship that we should have with one another and with the Father. Now, when you're riding across the desert and you're on your own, you're on your own, all you have is yourself. I get that. But when you're in the midst of a, of, of, a, of, of a church or a work environment or a family, you have other people that can help you and love you and care with you. You don't have to just say, well, I'll get this done and I'll do it on my own terms and my own way. And if you don't like it, I'll just shoot you. That's not how it works. I mean, that's, that doesn't work. But we've all tried that from time to time, except for the shooting part. I've never really shot anybody before. But we, I can do this on my own. I don't need you. And it doesn't work that way. Peter said this, therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. This is a problem because as men, we don't want to humble ourselves to anybody. Because in, our, in, in culture, 
If we humble ourselves, we show weakness in our culture, we're leaving ourselves open to be, to be abused, cast aside, put away, not getting what we want. But in God's economy, we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. And why? After we humble, after we humble ourselves, he will exalt us. That's good. I like that idea. I don't have to do it on my own and be all prideful and arrogant and afraid. I can humble myself before God because he loves me fanatically. And not only will he hear me, but he will exalt me. He will lift me up in due time when it's appropriate and then casting all your care upon him for he cares for you. Casting all your care upon him for he cares for you. Can you imagine what it would be like to live a carefree life? A life where you don't have any worries, where nothing is bothering you. Oh, stuff still happens. Stuff's still going on around. You still got bills to pay and jobs to go to and, and all the things we have to deal with in life, but it's not your burden. You pass it on to the Father. In my front mind, I'm going, yeah, that's awesome. In the back of my mind, I'm going, how? How can that be? Because of Jesus. Because of his Holy Spirit is how that can be. It takes discipline. It takes practice. Try me and see that I'm good. That's what the Father said. And that's exactly what he's talking about. This face-to-face -face kind of relationship is what is at the center of Christ's heart for men, for you and I. Note how... After Jesus spent three years walking with his disciples, one day he said out of the blue, he said, no longer do I call you servants, but I call you friends. For all things that I heard from my father, I have made known to you. All things, this is God speaking, all things that I've made known from my father, I've made known to you. That's intimacy, that's transparency, that's availability. He wasn't holding anything back. He let everybody know. That is how an intimate relationship with, with one another, with family, with friends, with church members, that's how it looks. We don't hold back. Now, none of us can be that intimate with everybody. That's not the model. Jesus ministered to thousands and thousands of people throughout these three years, but there's only 12 that he shared this with. And 12 is a lot. I couldn't be that intimate with 12 people. But with my wife, I could. With my children, I am. And with three or four other men in my life, I'm that intimate with. But I couldn't do it any more than that. It's just too much. So I want to encourage you to, to find those spaces and those places in your life where you find men and women who you are close to, who you love and trust, that you can be vulnerable and intimate with. It will, it will, it will change your life. I believe that that's true. The problem is that just about everything in our lives as men seem to work against all of this. There are three things that seem to work against the possibility of having a confident relationship with God, which enables us to have this type of relationship with our children as well as other men. First of all, there's three things. First of all, there's a painful absence of models. Maybe this is just my experience, but as I was coming up as a very young man, my, my life was drastically... Uh, there was not a godly influence in my life with regards to men. Uh, my grandmother and my mother, but not men. I didn't know how a, 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 man, a man was supposed to behave other than what I learned in the world, which is part of the problem. Uh, number two, the ever-growing presence of corruption. Tom tomorrow, you're going to be at your jobs or in the marketplace taking care of your business. You're going to be surrounded by men who are corrupted, and women, too, who are corrupted. Now, what corrupts them? Well, the same thing that corrupts you and I is sin. That's what corrupts the world. That's what the, 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 what the Satan does. And, and, and even so much more than that, the corruption, it used to only happen on that side of town or over in that area of life. Every single day, you and I go in and we open up a valve of corruption to our house called the Internet. That's where people are being corrupted in the 21st century. And that corruption is, is, is evident in our, in our morals and mores in our culture, but it's also evident in the lack of intimacy between people. 
Because people become objects and people become uh, something to be viewed and not experienced. And it's just a very, it's just a tragic thing. And the third thing is the consciousness of our own failures. And this is one is really huge. If you really know who I am and what I've done and where I've been, you can't love me. And that's such a sad lie. That's such a sad lie. Because in Jesus, even though you do know who I am and what I've done and where I've been, you can love me because of Christ that's in you and the Christ that's in me. The Holy Spirit allows us to love one another, to forgive and overcome and allow those things that are true and real, the love of the Father, to connect us. Have you ever noticed, maybe it's just me, that sometimes when we're in groups of people, we're connected by things that are either really, really good or really, really bad. When I was a young man, most of the things that I did that was unbecoming, I did with a group of people. Very rarely was I alone. You know what I'm talking about? But it's the same way. Uh, on the other side of that same coin is also true. If you and I spend time with a group of people who are engaged and are work, and working and living a loving relationship with Jesus Christ, we tend to be like the people that we're with. And that will influence the rest of our life as well. When I think about the consciousness of, our, of my own failure, I have to remember this, is that all of us sin. Everybody sins. There's nobody sin free. We, we were sinners. We're now saved by grace. But in the act of receiving salvation, we still go bonehead every now and again. We mess up. Everybody sins. And our sins may have been, in the past, may have been very public or very private and shielded. Um, and we may have already come to the Lord and repented, and we know that we've been forgiven. How many of you know that when you repent to Jesus, you're forgiven? It's true. 100% of the time, if you repent, he is good and trustworthy to forgive. Amen? I'm glad. I'm glad. But, but still, the mind is riveted to our, to our scenes of failure. And, and God forgives, but often we can't forgive ourselves. Intimacy requires openness, and forgiveness of ourselves is where that openness is going to begin as well. You may, you may desire an intimate relationship with, with somebody else, but that sin that keeps popping up inside of your mind, even though you've been forgiven, it, forgiven of it, reminds you that you're just a fraud. You're just a fake and a phony. If people know who you really are, they're not going to love you. Let me tell you, that's not true. If somebody is judging you about what you've done in your past, they're not going to love you in the present no matter what. We need to set ourselves free of the things of the past and love each other for where we're at today. That's a good thing to do. There's three types of masculine relationship. Um, acquaintance. We have acquaintances, companions, and intimate friendships. Acquaintances are everywhere. They're in work. They're in church, sports, events. There's no commitment other than maybe knowing their name. And that's not even a requirement to have an acquaintance per se. People we end up in the same space together, even just for a few moments inside of an elevator or on an escalator or, or working inside of a workspace. They're everywhere. They're just acquaintances, but there's no commitment. There's no, there's no exchange of, of, of intimate relationship, de detailed information. There's none of that going on. Now, the second type of masculine relationship that happens is companions. They share a task or a goal, and they schedule time to do it. For me, it's golf. I, would, I don't play golf enough anymore. I played putt-putt a couple of weeks ago, and that was kind of awesome. I got a hole-in-one. It's pretty cool. Never had one of those before. But when you schedule time weeks in advance, you get four guys together. We're going to meet at the golf course at 2 o'clock, and we're going to play 18 holes, and it's going to be awesome. And you put it in your calendar, but after the golf game's over, you don't really talk to one another. You don't share intimate facts. With them. And that's okay. These kind of relationships are important, but it's not an intimate relationship. So he said, well, I've got my golf buddy. I have an intimate relationship. Well, probably not. Maybe, but probably not. And the third type of masculine relationship is intimate friendships. These are relationships where the real you is known by another person. That's scary. That's frightening sometimes. But have you ever noticed you made a friend and you want to take that friendship to the next level and you take a chance 
and you share that one thing that hardly anybody else knows about with that friend. And they respond, oh, man, that's rough. I've had experience like that, too. And you share experiences, and you learn to pray with one another, pray for one All those things happen, but you have to take the first step of being intimate. Don't be afraid to be you. Your experiences matter. You'd be surprised at how many people could share your experience with you to the extent of, 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 of commiserating, but even taking that and saying, that happened to me, and this is what I did. Wow, I never thought about that before. That kind of intimacy is, is, is so valuable. It's good to be real. It's good to be authentic is the word that people call it. It's, it's good to be honest with yourself and with others. You and I need intimate friendship with God. But we also need it with other men and women with women. It's so necessary. I don't know how many times I've had conversations with somebody in my office or other offices that I've had really struggling with life, Skip. I'm having a hard time. I'm having a hard time getting along with my kids. Me and my wife are at each other. I can't keep a job. I, I'm having a hard time in life. And, and one of my very first questions is, well, let's talk about you and Jesus. And then my next question is, let's talk about who you're close to. Who are your friends? How do you express that relationship? And, and nine times out of ten, I don't really have any. I'm lonely. I'm struggling. I don't know what to do. Intimate relationships or healing takes place in the context of those. Healing and freedom, authenticity, is, it takes place in the context of those intimate types of relationships. And, and they, they lead to healing, to restoration, and they bring about victory over the things in life. We were not meant to do life by ourselves. Even the Father said it's not good for man to be alone. That's when he created Eve. We're not supposed to be by ourselves. So I want to encourage you, uh, Bob, if you and your team come and, and get ready for our last set of worship, I want to encourage you to identify people in your lives that um, uh, may be helpful to you and so you can have a, a, a healthy, intimate relationship. Identify spaces in your life that's lacking those types of relationships and then reach out and get those. Uh, one of the greatest voids in the church, in, in our church, in any church, is men who not only have relationships, uh, uh, not only have deep, intimate relationships with Jesus, but men who are also open to developing real intimate relationships with one another. The church needs those. The church requires those really for it to function at its highest level. A, 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 a relationship that will be an example to their children and to the world. First John says that we will be known by how we love. A gift that you can give your family on Father's Day is a gift of you modeling intimate relationships to your children and to one another. That's a gift that you can give today. And, and it's a gift that you can give to your church as well. I hope that um, you enjoy your Father's Day, and I hope that you con uh, contemplate these ideas of intimacy. That they're not things to be afraid of. They're things that to be, to be received and open and, and valued as well. So we're going to worship, and then at the end of our worship time, uh, we'll have a little bit of time together, and then we'll be dismissed. So, Bob.